I was kind of I was telling Ryan this in the car before we got going is that a lot of this is going to be general rules of thumb. Um, so don't it's hard to like to do a workshop and make it sound like everything you're saying is law. Like it's kind of like always do this, never do this. These are just the, the things, at least in my opinion, that I will cover that are like in general, it's safe to do blank or like in general, it's probably good to not do blank. Um, so I would like that's my heart in all of this stuff is like at the end of the day, sometimes there are exceptions to like every rule. You know, it's like maybe it is good sometimes to like do some crazy stuff that nobody's really doing because that's like how you break out of things sometimes, break out of patterns and move forward a little bit. So keep that in mind. Um, don't take any of this as like, man, I'll, like he said that, like I'm never going to do that again in my life. Like maybe don't walk out like that, but just in general. So, uh, so a lot of you guys said most of you run software setups at your church, right? Is that basically what I'm hearing? Other than I know you had, you have a profit, which is so awesome. Uh, but most of you run software setups, right? Okay, cool. So one of the things I want to cover really quick and actually, before I get into, like, I want to start with some of the basics about, like, running, just to get us all on the same page, like, to start from the same ground and kind of build up the basics of, like, software setup, some stuff that you should just always do and always be aware of and understand. Before I do that, the main thing I really want to come, ar like, come around for you guys specifically as keys players, what I would hope that you would walk away with is I find myself asking three questions to myself, like, all the time or, like, this is my way of articulating what I feel like I, my approach is, um, is three questions. And like, I think it's helpful for anybody who plays keys and really basically any musician, but especially for keys players. The three questions are like one, I always ask myself is what I'm, is my approach dynamic? Um, so primarily what I mean by that is like, are you able to contribute in the best way to anywhere from the smallest moments to the biggest moments of of a gathering or service or like or a set. So if you don't have the ability to manipulate and control what you're doing to be able to like really dial in something something meaningful and valuable when it's small and when it's huge, then maybe like you should rethink some things or rework some things. And that, you know, obviously that applies to your playing but also to your sounds. Um, so we want to be able to like be a part of, you know, making the biggest biggest moments bigger and the smallest moments honestly smaller i think side note i think doing small moments is the hardest part sometimes i think it's really easy to just like kind of bang around on a piano but like i think it's hard to do to do low moments well um so that's the first thing that's the, like the first question I'm, i kind of want to like come around the second question is is my approach consistent i think a lot of times um i think a lot of times one of like the <laughs> the difficulties for a lot of keys players is it's almost like we have all these sounds and different things, but you kind of end up feeling like patch to patch or song to song that there's like just wild inconsistencies. It's like, man, this song sounds great, but then the next song just was like blowing me away. Like there's like synth all over the place and just like super in your face. And, and it doesn't mean you can't have different sounds. Of course, that's not what I'm saying, but I think consistency and even just like some like a lot of it is in tones but also just like in in the mix of what you've got going on and the general like approach even in your playing consistencies are going to be really important and there's ways to kind of like uh you know circle around and we'll talk a little theory in there too but to come around like you know even in the key that you're in how to like manipulate things and play certain voicings that will allow things to feel a little smoother a little more connected a little more consistent what's up Yeah. Yeah, what's up? Oh, yeah, questions on You're right. So I guess I'll read a question. Or honestly, I'll give you that mic. I don't know if that works. No, no, it's all good. Uh, well, so the question is, like, is that more for, like, your team, you said, or more for just, like, so that it's not jumping around, all that kind of stuff? And I would say it's, kind of, it's really both, I guess, in my head. You know, I mean, for people, like, I think consistency in, like, your, your approach and in your playing is people feel that. And so, especially like in band settings, I think one of the things that is more of like the intangible thing, and I think you guys will all, maybe somebody will come to head like in your mind. Um, 
but I want to be the kind of guy that it's like when I'm up there, people know exactly what they're going to get. Like, or they know like, man, he, like he's always going to be consistent with this or that or whatever. So a lot of it does pertain to playing. Um, some of it obviously pertains to sounds too, but I think at the end of the day, I want to be the kind of keys player where it's like, when I'm, when I'm on the team, everybody knows that they can count on me to provide like my piece of the puzzle every time. And it's always going to be consistent and it's never going to be like wildly, you know, out and about that kind of thing. Does that make sense? Um, the, the, like the third question. So the first two were, uh, is my approach dynamic? Second one was, is my approach consistent? And then the third one is, is my approach flexible? I think, uh, nowadays, especially, I think people, there's a lot of churches that love, um, to do. And I think this is a beautiful thing. Cause I think God moves in like, in ways that we don't always expect, uh, obviously. And so there are moments when something, God's like stirring something up in a room and we want to be able to be present in that and not shut that down because we weren't ready for it. Um, or shut that down because we don't know how to, like how to sit in that moment or how, like what to do with that. Um, so I think one of the best things for us is to have like from a rig standpoint, but also just a mindset and, and even in the way we design our sounds and the way that we have it set up for us to manipulate them and control them is we want to be flexible enough to where it's like, oh man, like if we want to, if we want to build back into this, like if we want to go back into a song, you know, can I, can we do that without it, like without it, you know, either not working out or like, are we going to be able to do that kind of stuff and really hit the highs that we want to hit? Um, and not, I just always want to be ready for what God wants to do in a moment. And so to be flexible with that, I think is a really valuable thing. So those are kind of the three questions. Like those are the things that at least to have in the back of your mind all the time. That's where I would start. All right, let's do some, uh, let's get some nitty gritty going. Um, so you guys all know, like, again, some of this stuff is just basic knowledge stuff, but I want to cover it in case it, it really does help, in my opinion. Um, does everybody know what MIDI, like, you guys all know it's an acronym, right? So even if you don't necessarily know what it means, like, understanding what it is is really important. So musical instrument digital interface. That's what MIDI stands for. Um, and so it is, quite literally, it's just a it's a digital language that allows like a, a, a keyboard or even just like a controller to talk with a computer. So it's just messages at its core. Like the everybody, I think everybody probably gets that, but at the end of the day, there's no audio coming from this keyboard. It's all just messages. Like the simplest form of that is like a note on, note off message kind of thing. And like with the note on, it says how hard it's playing, which is like, that's called velocity, obviously. I think most of you probably know that, but at its core, that's all MIDI is. It's just digital messages that tell the computer, like, hey, this is what's going on. Now, there's way more to it than that. There's plenty of other, you know, nuances and, like, uh, specifics and the details of how MIDI works and all that kind of stuff, um, like control changes and the different, like, or CC numbers, basically. You guys are probably familiar with that, too. Um, but at its core, that's what it is. So understanding that is kind of important. Also, to kind of cover, like, the rig I've got going on. These are like the basics of a software rig. And so I, like, I, like I've been saying, and most of you might be familiar with this, but basically what's going on is this is just a MIDI controller. So is this guy too. I've got a little Cork Nano Control 2 here. This is basically like the controller of choice for everybody nowadays, but it's because it's this tiny little thing, but it's got tons of knobs and faders. Mine is completely falling apart. As you can see, it's lost all of the plastic knobs and faders on it. But it still works, so that's why I still use it. Uh, it's also got layers and layers of tape on it from when I've changed things and that kind of stuff. But this is just another MIDI controller. That's all that's going on here. No audio in and out, just messages to the computer. Um, same thing with this guy over here. And I think you guys know this too, but MIDI can be 5-pin, like a 5-pin US... Uh, I think it's kind of called a DIM cable. I don't know what that stands for, but... Uh, you can go like through 5-pin MIDI cables, or you can go a lot of times through USB. Um, and from there, the computer side of it is obviously where all of like the actual audio is being generated, but you don't typically want to run audio out of your headphone jack, uh, because it's just going to be lower quality. You're using like the internal sound card, uh, for digital to analog, uh, audio conversion, like in the computer. It's just not going to be as high quality as if you use, uh, what's just called an audio interface. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this too, but 
most of them are meant for recording purposes primarily. Like a lot of them are meant for the analog to digital side so that the computer can recognize audio that's coming in. Um, and the conversion, the quality of the conversion is just going to typically be higher with an interface than it would be if you just use the headphone jack on your computer. Um, so that's why we do that. And it's going to at least output like a line level signal as opposed to whatever comes out of a headphone jack. It's just typically going to be a, a, like a lower gain signal as far as I understand it. I feel like that tends to be what happens. So we've got a computer. I'm just using a, it's honestly an old, it's a very old interface. It's an old like PreSonus Fire Studio something. I don't know. So the one I just had broke. So this is like my old dinosaur that I threw in here so that I could actually have one. Um, and you can have a bunch of different kind of interfaces, but that's what I've got going on. A lot of times, as far as my rig goes, and a lot of places do this, I'll run two stereo channels, so four channels of audio total. Um, the first stereo channel is like what I'll send any kind of like piano or lead sounds down. And the second stereo channel is where I'll send any like pad or supported sounds down. I'm sure that's familiar for a lot of you. Um, but at least that way, the reason we do that is to give front of house control over uh, processing those two kinds of sounds differently is going to be pretty important as far as like the mix is concerned. It's also nice for them to be able to pull up like, you know, if you're playing something important on piano that the layered pad underneath doesn't really need to be that important. It helps for them to be able to pull that stuff up if they need to without pulling up all of like the swimminess that comes with it from pad sounds, stuff like that. Um, so that basically covers like the hardware part of the rig. It's literally just an interface and a computer with MIDI controllers. That's like the guts of it. Um, now, the specifics of like of the software itself, I want to talk just briefly about some good rules of thumb. Uh, first off, if you're running like a software rig, always turn off your Wi-Fi uh, like to begin with. That's going to be an important thing. Uh, there's a lot of things nowadays like, you know, on computers, there's just going to be tons of things listening to Wi-Fi in the background. If it's on, uh, you just don't need that. And your computer's going to be working just at least a little bit harder than it needs to because it's listening to things it doesn't need to listen to while you're trying to use it to play keys. So always turn your Wi-Fi off. It's just a good thing. Also, go turn on Do Not Disturb. That's always going to be important, too. Nobody wants to be the guy that like gets a text message and it like dings through in the middle of like a worship set or something. So no matter what, I mean, like every time I do anything, I just hop right up here and like just switch it on. Um, it's just a safe route. I have Wi-Fi on, by the way, because that's how I'm getting my display back to like the back right now. We uh, tried HDMI and it just wasn't working. So, um, but those are two rules of thumb. The other thing I want to talk about is the details of like um, whether you're using Reason, Mainstage, Ableton, whatever. There's two really important settings. Uh, so here, I'm going to show you here in main stage, but as far as the software side of things goes, <coughs> there's two things, sample rate and buffer size. You guys are, may or may not be familiar with this. There are two really important numbers. Um, sample rate has to do, I don't want to get too in the nitty gritty, but it has to do with um, how frequently, or uh, like how many times a second digital audio is being converted to analog audio, basically. Um, so, and there's, a, there's meaning behind the numbers, but uh, I would typically, like, the higher the sample rate, the better the quality, but it also makes your computer work harder from, like, a processing standpoint. Um, so you want to, like, you want to kind of find the sweet spot where you can run at the highest sample rate you can. Uh, without compromising stability with your computer. You, the last thing you want is to be playing and stuff to get, like, start popping and blipping and blapping, that kind of stuff, because it does happen. Um, so, like I said, the higher the sample rate, the higher the quality. Really what you end up getting, uh, if you look into the details of it, is your top end gets more clarity, uh, because the sample rate, like, you know, you're trying to use ones and zeros to, uh, to create you know, audio. And so the higher frequencies, the higher, like when you get up close to like that 15 kilohertz to 20 kilohertz range are easier to more accurately reproduce with a higher sample rate. Like if you're running at 48K or 96, you can more accurately recreate the analog audio of like those high end frequencies. If you run at higher sample rates, that's kind of what's going on there. Um, I'm at 44.1 now. 
I would typically suggest 48 kilohertz. Like, I think it's a good rule of thumb. I'm at 44.1 just because, I mean, sometimes if I know I'm kind of running either like a huge session or if I'm doing something where I, like, I'm screen sharing right now, it's just not, yeah, I don't need to push it too hard. But 48K is, in my opinion, is like a good route to go. The other number or the other setting is buffer size is really important. Um, buffer size has to do with, um, as far as I understand it, again, this could be like a little misguided, but it's basically think of like the computer is sending packets of information to the interface and then it's converting those packets into audio and then playing them back like so that you can hear what you're playing. Uh, so the smaller the buffer size, the smaller the packet of information it's sending so that it can send audio out faster. Um, if that makes sense, like if you had a huge buffer size, it would have to take this huge packet of information process it, convert it, and then stream it out. And that's why you end up with more latency. Uh, so that's really at its core. The buffer size has to do with latency, which is the time between when I hit this key and when I hear it. That is like typically primarily manipulated with buffer size. So with buffer size, you want to go as low as you can. Again, without the lower that you go, obviously, the smaller the packets of information the computer's processing, which means it's working a lot harder a lot fat, like a lot more frequently. So your, your uh, CPU is gonna be taxed a lot harder if you run at a lower buffer size. Make sense? So keep it as low as you can so that the latency is low without pushing your processor too hard. Uh, and yeah, like I'm at 128, but, and it's different depending on what hard, like what interface and, and you know, other aspects of like what you've got going on in your session. But 128 for me has always been a pretty good, like a pretty good standard number, I guess. Um, 256 sometimes if like if you're just running tons of sounds and stuff like you can up it a little bit so that's some of like the annoying uh, like uber detailed but like kind of important stuff about software rigs that honestly like sometimes people walk up to something it's like man this is just this rig is freaking out on me and like I can't hardly play anything without it just like making all these clicks and pops all the time that's where you want to go to like check in on that kind of stuff make sense um, Okay, cool. I want to make sure I'm covering, I have some very unorganized notes about all of this stuff. Uh, does anybody have any questions about that stuff, too, while I'm here? Do you have any more granular feedback to, if your settings are right for what you're doing, besides, oh, it's popping or it's choking or it's the latency is too high? Is there any, like, visual or any meaningful feedback besides just the audio output? Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, you're basically just saying, like aside from finding the sweet spot, like is there any other like purpose to it? Is that kind of what you're saying? Or it's not so much the purpose. I mean Yeah, I mean so you're saying you'd like to just type quality as you can get. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah totally. Okay. Like yeah, cool. So I mean, my best suggestion would be like if you have a session like this, whether it's Reason or Main Stage, just go to whichever, whichever patch has the most processing heavy patch. A lot of times it's going to be, you know, of course, if you're stacking like five or six different sounds or something like that, um, usually you'll know which one is going to be your highest like processing heavy patch. I'll just go to that and then honestly, like I just start banging around, make it work as hard as I can, like just play tons, even if it's literally like, you know, sometimes I'll, when you're trying to find a setting, like I will go to whatever it is that I want to do and just like start doing this kind of thing. Like, like just making it work super hard, do tons of crazy stuff and see if it starts freaking out. If it can handle all that, and in main stage, like, and in Ableton, I'm sure Reason has this too, you can, you can actually see what your, uh, like what your CPU percentage is running at. So like when I'm doing all this stuff, you know, like I'm getting up to not even 50% on my 50 or on my CPU load. So like for me, that's super safe. It's up at the very top, like the, the bar on the left, if you look, and I also have a readout for it in percentage over here, like right beneath where it says workspace up at the top. So CPU load is at 16, 15% right now. Um, so that's like where I'm looking, but like I'll just do that kind of stuff, find the most processing heavy, just bang away on it and see like if it starts freaking out. So the only annoying thing too is when you change, uh, when you change settings, it has to like reload all of the samples that you're using for your libraries, like has to reload all of those back into RAM and it takes tons of time. Um, 
Does that answer your question? That's usually what I do. Um, and the latency thing, the buffer size thing is, for me is the most about latency. Like I, 128 feels good to me. I think 64 is always too, like makes my computer work too hard. Like I've never felt good about running at 64, even though the latency is great. It just feels too uneasy for me. Um, so go like as low as you can, like where it's like, oh, like the latency, I can feel it, but it doesn't really bother me. Um, and then like, I just, I don't need to go any lower than that. Like once you kind of find that breaking point, that's more for me. And then sample rate is more about, for me, is finding like the most intense patch. Uh, everybody with me still? We feeling good? No other questions about that stuff? Cool. All right. Um, so let's do this. Uh, I do want to cover, just for the sake of like understanding what I've got going on in main stage, uh, a really quick like cover of how main stage works. So, you know, I've created, you can create like a layout in main stage and I, I basically have just made my layout look like what the controllers that I've got are at least similar enough. Um, so like it's got eight faders on it and tons of buttons, which I'm only using some of those buttons and then eight knobs. So you can map all that stuff in here in main stage super easy just so that your actual MIDI controllers respond to, or that your software responds to the hardware controls, that kind of thing. Um, and then as far as main stage is set up, the higher, it has like its, its own built-in hierarchy in a sense, um, which this will help like as I'm walking through things, understanding how I've got it set up. So at the concert level, which is the highest level, like think of this as the highest level of the hierarchy. If you map things at the concert level, it will be that way throughout the entire concert, like the whole session. Um, so, and I'll cover some of what I actually do have going on from like the concert level, but just so you know, you can do things from concert level, there's set level, which means that anything that would fall in this folder of patches uh, would be the case for all of the patches in the folder. Um, and then you can also do things at a patch level, which would be like the individual sounds and patches that I've got going on. And over here on the right side is like our channel strip, you know, inspector, I guess, or channel strip window, where you've actually got all of the individual sounds themselves, the different layers of like what I've got going on. So as far as my session goes, typically my setup looks like this, where at the top, like at the concert level, a lot of times I'll have at least a second keyboard, like this little mini guy that I've got over here. I have it set up to do um, more of like a drone pad concept, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with. But um, before I even go a step further with it, like I want to give you like a very strong warning about the drone pad thing. Hey, Jeff Finison. Uh, I don't overuse it. Like it's a, like it's a, I know it's kind of like a pretty commonly used thing in worship music right now. And I, you know, I'm basically admitting and saying right now that I do too. Um, but it also is one of the worst things that you can do if you don't, if you don't mix it right. So uh, I also know some guys who are adamantly against like the drone pad idea. And that's actually more where I align with a little bit, but I use it because it can be so helpful sometimes. Um, just my like strongest warning to you is like if you put too much of, does everybody kind of know what I'm talking about when I talk about like a droning pad kind of thing? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's such a worship music thing to do, but like if you have, you know, yeah, let's say you're in the key of C, like your one and five, which are gonna be your friendliest notes like in the key of C, um, because they work with, as far as voicings go, it's like it works with the most chords in the key. That's why like the one and five from a theory standpoint is like what people use for this. Um, but to kind of have something like this hanging in the background, I don't know if my sustain pedal's mapped, but you get the idea. So that's what I'm talking about. When I, and some guys will use, like I actually use an instance of Omnisphere, like it's a patch that I have that I use for that kind of stuff, but some people will use like a looped, um, you know, like an actual looped like WAV file kind of thing where it's literally just like a playing, a looping piece of audio in the background. Uh, so that's part of my rig and I have that at the concert level so that throughout my entire set, like patch to patch, no matter what I do, I can use that. I'm also trying to figure out why that's not. Oh, you know what, I, don't, I didn't plug in the sustain pedal. Hang on a second. <laughs> that's really important. Sustain pedals are really important, guys. Most of the is, uh, <laughs> I, also, I also have a million dollar idea for somebody out there who wants to be the first person to do this. 
first person to start making really high quality sustained pedals that don't break every like year will be a millionaire. I don't know why somebody hasn't like, just somebody start making boutique sustained pedals and you'll like, you'll be set for life, man. I know, that's all it is. But all I'm saying is like these pieces of junk, like they just go out all the time. But yet I find myself spending 30 bucks every like however many months and that's just the way it goes. Anyway, that was a quick side note. So yeah, that's the kind of thing though, is like if you're playing in C. Let me get like a piano sound going or something here. Great. So like you're kind of playing in the key of C all on top of like. So it just worked like the one in five, as far as theory goes, works with the most number of chords in the key. Um, but the problem is that when you hear guys, like if you really mix too much of that in, like to what you're playing, people start to recognize like, oh, I'm hearing like the same pad going on that's just never changing and nobody wants that. Like that's just, like what it ends up doing is fatiguing like your listeners. They just, they get so much of the same thing constantly that like you, you just get tired of it. So don't do that. Like be... If you are gonna use the drone like latched pad concept, just make sure that you're gonna mix it in at like a, a good volume. Don't overdo it. You just don't want to fatigue people. So and know which chords not to play when you have Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's important too. Like be mindful of if you've got like if you're doing something a little more gospely and uh, you know, there's there's chords outside of kind of like your what's the scale called? Is it Ionian scale kind of thing? Uh, like, or mode, I guess, is what the proper, like, term for it would be, like, but if you're going to have, like, like, a major two or a major three in a song, that's not really going to work. You're going to have some serious, like, clashing stuff going on, so be mindful of that. Uh, so I've got that set up at the top level. At the set level, what I, this is, again, this is kind of my approach, but um, I have a stack of some pads, like, set up on my set level so that all of the patches I create in here will have that stack of pads in them. Uh, the other thing that I've done is I've adjusted, um, I've adjusted like their where they are on the keyboard as far as um, like what range of keys that actually play the sounds for those pads. Uh, the reason I do that is because if I'm going to be playing something kind of high up, like on a piano sound, I don't really want the pad to be responding to that stuff that's super high up for the most part. If it's like kind of my go-to, I guess I would call this like my stock pad stack of sounds. So what I've done is I have all of the pad stuff stop, I think at like E2, I think, is it, or, or sorry, not E2, but this E right here above, like an octave and a half above middle C. So like if I play this E, nothing's gonna voice, but right here is like the last note that actually responds to like my playing as far as, as high up on the keyboard. So that way like if I'm playing lead stuff on a piano, it just doesn't start to get really shrill and really like a little too bright, that kind of thing. Um, so I've got that set up at the set level. And then that way, in, as far as each of the patches in here goes, uh, when I switch around, they're always going to be there. So I can be playing this piano, and it's going to be there. And then I can switch through, be like at a different patch, different piano sound. And no matter what I play, it's, it's always going to be there. Make sense? So I like setting it up that way because for the most part, like, of course, I bring in different sounds and all that kind of stuff, but it's nice to kind of have my go-to one there all the time. Um, and that way you can, like, you don't ever really have to worry. You've at least always got, like, something there. If you need it, you can just pull it up. Um, this, lost all of, this all got mixed up. Uh, the other thing I want to cover, like, I'm going to get into some, like, playing stuff. Um, but it's important to understand like a few concepts before getting into like the approach to playing. Uh, are all you guys familiar with low pass filters or like the idea of what a low pass filter is kind of maybe ish? Okay, I'll cover it real quick. So a low pass filter is like if you, as far as what it is, is it literally is a filter that passes frequencies below a certain point. That's why it's called a low pass filter. Um, and so it passes the frequencies below uh, the point is called the cutoff frequency. Um, and honestly, like, so as far as you guys being into creating sounds and that kind of stuff, if you're in a plugin, basically every synth plugin is going to have some kind of form of a low pass filter on it, probably. Um, 
the reason that low pass filters are so helpful to know about um, is because they do this wonderful thing, which is, you know, mixing volumes is one thing. It can get a little, uh, sometimes it can get to be like a little bit of maybe too much work. Like if you were always trying to use just like one pad sound that was like, you know, it a lot, basically low pass filters give you the ability to manipulate a sound to where it fits in any moment. Kind of when I was like talking about being dynamic with your sounds. So if I want to be able to play underneath like a low moment in like in a service, you don't really want your pad sound to just be like blazing away with tons of high, like high frequency information. Like, like this doesn't really work for like if you're at the beginning of a song or something and like, or you're playing underneath like a pastor that kind of thing like that just doesn't really work it's just too epic now the point is though is that at some point i probably do want to be able to get that big like at some point i want to be in this kind of a zone where i can just be like blazing away on something and have it like fill up that extra space like you want to be able to get to the point where like you're filling all of that space right but you just don't want it to be that way all the time and even if you like, you'll hear the difference too. If I leave the, the filter wide open on this pad sound and I just bring the volume down, it still just doesn't work, right? Like it's still just too, too bright, too buzzy. So what low pass filters do is it gives you the ability to filter out all of that high energy, like high frequency information and still just leave the rest of like the warm, low, like the low content as you bring the cutoff down on the filter. So let me show you visually kind of what's going on. Uh, let's do this. <clears throat> so here is, this is just an EQ. I've actually just got like, so a low pass filter is actually on like basically every generic uh, like EQ plugin. It's literally just like the guy that slides around up here and, and cuts out. Like you, you'll see as I'm pulling it down, that slope there, which you can change the slope of it with how many dB per octave, like your, uh, like the, just the slope of the filter. Um, so it's a more drastic cut. If I increase how many dB it's like, it's cutting per octave as you go up in the frequency spectrum. Um, but basically all that's happening is if I play, I have this organ sound. It's got like a ton of really bright. Here's the analyzer. You can kind of see like it's got tons of like uh, high frequency information in it. But as I slide this low pass filter down, which again, this is the cutoff frequency I'm pulling down. It's just gonna darken it up a little bit, warm up the sound, because it's getting rid of all of that really bright stuff. And then now it's something that actually like feels pretty like dark and warm and like it plays well underneath things. It doesn't feel like too massive, too bright, that kind of thing. Makes sense? So that's why it's super useful. It also makes it so that you don't have to be playing with your volumes quite as much. Like from a dynamic standpoint, I actually use, it's more just the concept of using your frequency spectrum as your dynamics more than just your playing. Your playing is gonna be the best use of like how you're controlling your dynamics. But at the end of the day, like using the frequency spectrum like that is also gonna be your best friend. So I can play just as hard on this and then open it up and all of a sudden like it's perceived more loudly and like it's perceived as being more upfront and in your face just because of the frequency spectrum. So uh, that's one thing that I use a ton. Um, so all of these concepts, like uh, if getting to a little bit of like of playing, like the approach to the instrument, having these kind of tools at your hands to be able to manipulate as you go is gonna be really important. Because like I said, you know, as, as keys players, your piano playing is gonna be the most important part of it, but knowing how to manipulate your sounds to be able to like dynamically bring things in and out is also gonna be your best friend, like from an, an approach standpoint. My throat's good, dry. <clears throat> yeah, so I actually was gonna mention that too. So it's a great question. Uh, with pads, you can either there's different ways to set this up and a lot of plugins will have their own like spot to be able to change this kind of setting. Um, so the question has to do with, you know, obviously when you play a piano sound, the harder you play, the louder the sound. With pads, 
you can kind of manipulate that setting, whether or not you want it to dynamically respond to your playing. If you want the pad sound to play back louder when you hit harder, um, the other thing you actually can do is you can do velocity controlled on, uh, filter control. Um, I don't know if I said that right, but basically the harder I play, if I want the filter to open up more when I play harder, you can do that a lot of times too. Uh, my personal preference on that is that I don't particularly love uh, the volume of a pad to be like controlled by velocity at all. Like I don't, the reason for that for me is that again, I try to approach it more as using the frequency content for like the dynamics of it all. So I would, I like knowing that, I'm gonna get rid of that. If I'm playing this, you know, if I'm really digging in, actually what you're hearing there is a little bit of the filter opening up when I play harder. So it does brighten up a little bit if I play, and I only have it just enough to where like, I can leave the cutoff, like not play with the filter on my pad sound and it'll at least respond, give you just enough dynamic to it where like if I start digging in and I'm not changing where the cutoff is, it still responds to my playing and feels a little bit less, if not quite as static. But as far as the volume of it goes, I like knowing that if I like, if I'm in a really low moment and I've like just barely played my last note, I still like knowing that when I bring this pad up, it's gonna be there, you know what I mean? Um, so that's my thing is, I don't necessarily want it to control the volume of my pad a ton. And maybe I could even like A, B this a little bit uh, for the sake of like, because it is an important setting. Sometimes pad sounds, like if you, this is one of the sounds I've got going on. It's kind of the main one that you're hearing in there. It's from a plugin that emulates like an old Juno keyboard. Uh, so let's see, it would be here. So. So I just barely played the keys, and now there's nothing there. So I basically what I did is I turned the velocity control all the way up as far as it like controlling the volume of the playback of like the synth. So I'm barely playing right now, and you like, as you can tell, it's just like barely there, which if I'm playing a, a stacked piano on top of that, I obviously like, I wanna be able to like hear that piano, but I wanna hear the pad too. Like I don't want the pad to disappear when I'm playing at low velocities. Um, and right now it's just not there. Whereas usually what I'll do is I'll leave that setting all the way off. And now if I like play, the pad's like super present, it's still right there. And if I want less of it, I'll just pull the volume down. Like that's not hard, um, but I wanna know that it's there. Same thing, like as you can see right here, this little, you know, it's different on, wait, where's my mouse? Can you guys not see my mouse up there? That's random. I guess you can't. Well, anyway, it's this guy right here, the one I'm moving around right now. That's where it's controlling, uh, yes, thank you, whoever that was. <laughs> That's where it's actually controlling the cutoff, uh, like as it's res the cutoff frequency, or really it's like, it's controlling, I guess the envelope on the filter basically is what it's controlling at the end of the day. But if you turn that up, it means that the velocity is the envelope is going to respond more to your like the velocity of your playing. So if I turn it all the way up, it means like the cutoff on the filter would basically be. Well, I guess it's just not. It has well. That basically that's where the the filter control for the velocity would come from. So I like it on just a little bit. Basically, like if I leave it all the way off, it would never like respond to any of my playing. Like I could play really hard really soft and the filter is not going to change at all. If I turn it up even just a little bit, which is where I usually like it, and you'll hear the difference. I'll pull the piano out of it. So like here's low velocity. There's like super hard velocity. So one thing to be like to be aware of though when that kind of if you're playing with these kind of settings is if you end a song or something and you have played like your last chord super hard or maybe you're sustaining like a really, like a you played the highest note in your voicing really hard, but you're kind of sustaining it through stuff. Like as I come down in velocity with the rest of my playing, that high five, you guys hear the G, like I'm playing in the key of C. This note right here is really sticking out because I played that note at a really high velocity, like, and I, but then I was just sustaining it through as I was playing the rest of this stuff, so. 
So the rest of the notes as I'm changing through are like are the filters closing back off for that stuff, but that note is like really sticking out because it was the last one I played at a high velocity. So you have to be aware of stuff like that, understanding how your plugins work and how they, you know, how they respond to your playing. Um, because I find that sometimes like I'll be going along and all of a sudden realize like, man, one of my notes is just like blaring out because it's the last one I played high velocity. So uh, that is an important thing to be aware of for sure. Everybody tracking with me so far? So that's a great question though, because I did want to talk about that setting specifically. I like the volume to not be manipulated uh, from velocity at all, but the filter just a touch, just to help it like respond a little bit to playing. What's up? Uh, yeah, so I mean, as far as like what you're seeing up here, you mean, is that kind of what you're talking about? Yeah, because you can match it, like, you know, filter, filter control knobs, input mm -hmm. knob on the keyboard or the MIDI controller, mm -hmm. you can match different like level of control to faders on the controller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you operating mostly in the software on yourself, or do you map anything to either of those Okay, I think I'm tracking with your question. Uh, Right. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, so the reason that, like, basically everything that you're seeing on these faders as I go through, sometimes like it looks different for each one, but it, I have things mapped there for me to be able to manip like to manipulate live. Like that is the reason that like I've got all of this stuff mapped. Like some patches, you know, I may not have as many things that I want to be able to like manipulate. So it's like it might look a little simpler. Um, but patch per patch, I will map certain things that I know I want to play around with. Um, and so kind of going back to what I was saying too, at the set level, I have those, like that pad stack is on all of the patches in this folder. But I've got the, like that, this fader right here is going to be mapped to the cutoff on those pads in each patch. I don't know if maybe this is kind of answering your question. So like it's all this, I always know, and I've got it labeled on here too, this fader is always going to be the cutoff on like my main pad stack. So as I go through, you'll notice like even the label of it just won't change, like you'll see me scroll through. But that fader is always going to be cut off, and it's always going to be, you know, if I go patch to patch, it's going to stay the same, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing from like a setup standpoint, and this also pertains to what I've got mapped, is these first three faders I have set up, so I run... I have all of my sounds set up on like buses basically. So it helps with the routing as far as when I was talking about what, how many outputs you're using, like two stereo outputs, like you've got you know, a piano channel or whatever, like your lead sounds stereo. And then you've got like a stereo channel for all your background stuff. Well, I've kind of got at the top tier level, I have, I've created buses for like, for all of my piano sounds, they're all gonna go through a piano bus. Um, so at the patch level, you know, when I create my piano sounds, I have to tell them to go through that bus. It just takes a second. But at the end of the day, the nice thing is that when I go patch by patch, I don't have to keep remapping my piano volumes per patch. Like I'll get them set where I want them so that when it's up at unity level, like the, the fader is right at zero, that the piano is like as loud as I want it to be. But then patch by patch, if I pull that fader down, none of these pianos will come through because they're all being routed through that bus. Um, so right now, like, just the pad is voicing, and like, I have tons of different piano sounds, but that fader's down. It's changing which piano sound I'm playing, but they're all routed through a bus where the volume's pulled all the way down. Same thing with that pad stack. Like, this is my, my I guess, my pad bus. Um, but also if I have a patch where I'm playing other pad sounds on top of like my normal pad stack, they're going to be routed through the same thing. So I know that if that, if this fader is down, I'm not going to get any pad stuff. Like it's all going to be gone. Like I've got just piano here now. Um, so it's kind of nice. And then same thing obviously for the latch as well. Like if that's down or the drone pad, uh, it's going to be that way for every patch. I don't have to keep remapping that. It's a super helpful feature in main stage. It might look a little different for other ones, but setting things up on buses like that can be really helpful for you to just see, I've got those three faders. All of my sounds basically are gonna pass through one of those three buses. Like if it's, I have it labeled piano, but if it's like a lead synth sound, I'll probably dump it down through like the piano bus. Um, 
and then any background stuff will go through pet, like the pad bus and then my drone bus is like is basically just the drone. Um, I also have my far right one at the concert level map to just like a master. Uh, it's really just controlling like master volume. It's functioning more as like a, I think a VCA. I should be asking these audio guys, like the audio nerds. I think that's probably what that is. Um, but basically I know that if I pull my farthest right fader down, I got nothing. So it doesn't matter to me if like, if those first three faders are up, that's kind of what's generally controlling my volumes. If I've got the master down, I have nothing, which is a, for me, I like having it set up that way. Uh, did that answer your question, kind of, Casey? Yeah, I'm just thinking about how, like, live, how much of these guys can practically be touching software versus controlling some of those things that are just on the physical hardware in front of them. Oh, you mean like on? You mean like on with a mouse? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, practically, you can be doing more on the fly. Yeah. They have a reach over and, like, navigate to where it's at in the software. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. Okay, I think I, I get what you're getting at. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, anything that I know I want to, if there's a certain setting, like, you know, we were talking about how the the filter envelope and, like, how the volume of my pad, my pad sounds respond to the velocity of what I'm playing. That stuff... I know I don't want to manipulate live, so I'm not going to MIDI map that to any of my hardware controls. Whereas, like, I very much want access to control of the cutoff on the filter because I am going to play with that live. Like, if that opens up, or if I want to be able to open up my pad sound in the middle of a song or br dial it back, like, I don't want to have to be, like, f fumbling around to try and get to it. I want it to be right there all the time. So, like, I'll map that there all the time. Like I said, those first three, like, the volumes thing, I, I want to know that if I want pad... Like, or if I don't want it, I want to know that it's on that fader. So, like, I don't necessarily need access to a lot of the other features maybe that are in the sound. Like, certain things, it's just, like, I don't need to manipulate this. So, I'm not going to overmap things. But whatever I want access to, like, I will definitely put it. That's why this little guy is so handy, is I can literally, with whatever keyboard I'm playing, I can sit it right in front of me. <clears throat> right in front of me. And with my left hand, like, I can be bouncing back and forth constantly, just, like, playing with stuff. Um, it kind of like really brings what you're doing to life a little bit. Um, okay, cool. I want to talk like a little bit before, like we'll break for lunch here pretty soon. Um, but from like a, from a playing standpoint, I want to just cover like kind of overall approach to, you know, what's helpful, what's not, like what, um, like good rules of thumb. I think my help, my most like valuable rule of thumb when it comes to playing would be always be aware of the lead vocal. Um, so when it comes to like playing, and obviously there's other things you want to be aware of all the time, really, I mean, you want to be aware of what everybody's doing. Um, but especially in worship music, the lead vocal is going to be king. So like, if you're doing something that's going to interfere with the lead vocal, at least too much, um, as a rule of thumb, just be aware of what's happening there all the time. Uh, a lot of that has to do with what voicings you pick, right? So... Um, so let me try to think of an example. Um, actually, here's a great here's a great example. Thank you. You're the man. So from a voicing standpoint, in general, you probably want to stay away from things that are going to clash with like with what the melody of the of the song is doing. Um, and also from a basic standpoint, we'll start here. Like I know a lot of people kind of start from a place of playing. You kind of you kind of play a lot of your voicings with like the one and five of the scale in it. Kind of the same concept as the drone pad. Like you can get a you can get away with playing a lot of voicings with just I'm playing in C right now, so C and G. Uh, again, they're the most friendly with like with all of the chords that you would play in the normal major scale. So I can kind of play like like all of those chords work with the one and five. It doesn't necessarily sound uh, bad, uh, but at the same time, it is. There's, there's like a quality about that that starts to feel a little bit like the drone pad thing that I was talking about, which is it starts to fat like fatigue people. If you use too much of the same voicing all the time in all of your chords, 
Um, so if I'm just basically staying around those notes all the time and all of these chords, it starts to feel like even though the chords are changing, what you're playing isn't really changing. Like, and people will notice that and you don't want that. Um, so that's like kind of my first, I guess, caution, I will say, is that it is a great thing uh, to be able to use as far as voicings. The reason that they work uh, is because like they're friendly with all of the chords, but don't take too much advantage of those voicings. That's one of the things that bothers me the most sometimes when I hear guys just like hammer away on the one and five, it just sounds too vampy. Like it's already getting on my nerves, just like hearing me play this. Does you, like, do you guys feel kind of what I'm saying? So be aware of that like, and know when it, it needs to change up. And a big part of this is going to be understanding inversions as well. So I know most of you guys are probably aware of this, but you know, a C chord would be, would be your, like your C, E, G. Uh, that's kind of like your root form is when like the, the root of the chord is, in the, is the lowest note that you're playing. Like then it's stacked with the third and the fifth. That's kind of called like I think root form. But you can hear as I'm like moving around like that, it doesn't necessarily, it, it feels blocky and feels kind of jumpy. That's like the polar opposite end of like the droning one and five. Um, is that if I kind of stay in root form all the time, it starts to sound jumpy and like and disconnected. And that's another quality that we don't necessarily want. So we want to we want to start from understanding inversions too, which would be if you've got root form, if I take that low C and bring it up an octave and leave the E in my root, that's like, uh, or it's, I guess it's not the root, but that that I would call first inversion. I think is the right like somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. Theory people, first inversion, second inversion would be if you bring the E up the octave and then I've got G C E, so I've got like the fifth on the bottom root in the middle, third on top. Understanding all of those chords and knowing how to move through, they're all C chords, but they're just different inversions of those. Knowing how to move around them and play different versions of the same chord is gonna help you a ton to be able to make your playing feel more connected. Uh, so if I'm playing this, like that sounds, it doesn't sound like bad. They're all the, like the chords are just fine. But if I start using inversions for those different chords to help, in general, if my hand's doing a little less motion like that, it's going to feel a little more connected. So if I play my C chord here, I might play my G chord here, where in my right hand I'm playing, that'd be a first inversion G. And then I'm playing a first inversion A minor there, like in my right hand, and then like a second inversion F here. So that versus, like it just sounds, there's a quality to that that feels a little jumpy and disconnected versus this. Like your voicings in general aren't jumping around as much, so the playing feels more connected, more smooth. And typically, like that's a quality that, that most people are going to want. Uh, that's like the first thing as far as a voicing thing goes. But then the other thing I wanted, I wanted to mention is being aware of what the lead vocal is doing all the time. So for me, I guess like maybe a good example of this would be uh, like Reckless Love. Um, a section where like this has caught me off guard before, if you're not careful, like on the bridge, basically the hook of this song is the bridge melody, right? Uh, if you start playing, I'm sure you guys have like, have all played this song before, but the hook is, and then it jumps up like one, scalar degree the next time through. So that's like the hook. But on the bridge, the melody doesn't do that, like that jump in the scalar degree. Like it doesn't do that second portion of that melody. It just stays on the same one. So basically what I'm saying is if you're not careful in that song and you were just kind of playing along and you got to the bridge and you started playing the hook, they were singing along with the bridge, what you would be playing on that next phrase would be like basically what the lead, the lead vocal would be doing and what you're playing would be clashing by like one scalar degree. And that just isn't going to work. So like being aware of what the lead vocal is doing all of the time is going to be super important for you deciding what voicings you want to roll with and like that kind of stuff. I wish there was another, um, 
I'm trying to think of another like common example. Um, maybe what a beautiful name would be a good idea. Um, uh, there's a spot in the verse. Um, uh, you do not want to live without us. You do not know heaven. Things like like there is a moment in that chord right there where the lead vocal is actually passing through a note that's not in the chord. So a lot of times, if I hear moments like that, I'll try to help support what the lead vocal is doing. Uh, so, you didn't want to live without us, so Jesus, you didn't So right there, it's actually, it is a six chord that's happening there, but what I'll do is I'll pass through this note right here. It's passing through a note that's not actually in the sixth chord. So if I was going to play this instead, I didn't want to live without us, Jesus, you brought so it's passing through, the lead vocal is doing the four of the scale, uh, but what I was playing as part of the B minor chord is just the normal, like, F sharp would be in the B minor, if you're tracking with me. So the lead vocal's here, and my voicing is here. So what I'll do is I'll actually just accent what the lead vocal's doing in moments like that. So you're like, it shows that you're aware of what's happening in the song and what the melody is doing, so that you're not just like playing along chords, you're actually aware of like, okay, really like the vocal there for a second is bringing a little bit of tension to the chord and then resolving it as it passes through. So I'll bring out stuff like that on purpose. Um, it's just like a good way to make sure that you're not clashing with the most important part of the song, which is the lead vocal. Tracking with me? Make sense? Uh, the other thing as far as like a playing concept will go, and then I think we'll probably break for lunch here in just a minute. Um, I also, uh, I tend to use octaves like uh, as a, a pretty quick, easy like technique to bring parts out that I want to bring out. Um, so whether it is, you know, maybe it's the hook of Reckless Love, um, you know, like it's one thing to play that like this. that's all fine and dandy, like you can hear the part and everything. But if I layer that with like an extra octave on it, it just helps bring the part to the forefront and really just re-emphasizes like the melody of what you're trying to bring to the table as a keys player. So that was just like the higher octave or really like the best contrast would be if I were just playing it in this lower octave as a single note thing. Versus Like it just helps bring that part out and bring it to the forefront when you can use octaves as a way to just bring out whatever. And it, you know, that works for basically any song. I mean, if you're trying to play, I had a little list of songs I was gonna try to remember that are good ones to like, that everybody kind of knows. Um, yeah, and I mean, What a Beautiful Name, honestly, is a great example of that too. You know, you can play, honestly, what might even be on the record might just be a single note thing like, So like you could play that kind of thing as just a little single note thing. But if it was me, like I always like trying to bring out that kind of stuff with a little bit of extra, like I use octaves on that part instead just to help bring it out. It just helps bring the part to the forefront. And it's a quick and easy thing, like instead of just playing little single note things, if you layer it with an octave and sometimes, I mean, I'll even go as far as like, I've done this on going back to Reckless Love. I've done this with three octaves too. Like if you have, yeah, I mean, yeah, if you got five hands, like there are times that if I really want to bring something out, like, like if it's the end of a song or something like that, or like it's that last outro, like I've done. So like I'm, I'm not hitting the first note with it, but I'm jumping up with my left hand and playing like, I'm playing three octaves on the same part and it just really brings the part to the forefront, you know? Uh, so using octaves like that is one thing. The other part of kind of this same conversation, you can hear it a little bit uh, as far as like, this is a combination of like sounds and crafting like your, 
your setup with what you're playing is I'll use layering sounds a lot too. And I know we've kind of already obviously hit on that a bunch with the layered pad sound kind of thing. It's like not a new concept for anybody to have like a pad that's going underneath your piano sound. Um, but what I, like lately what I've been experimenting with is having either extra added sounds on maybe towards the top end of my keyboard that can help bring out a part or maybe just a different kind of sound. So th this is a good example of a patch that's like that where um, I've got an electric grand sound, which is like an old CP80 uh, keyboard or piano. What'd you say? Yeah, it's awesome. And it has much more of like a, you can hear it, it's much more of like a bell tony kind of quality to it. It's got a good bit of brightness to it, but it's also, I've got it pretty heavily compressed and like verbed out a good bit. Um, but the point being is that it would be one thing, let me go to just like a normal, this is just like the same kind of grand piano sound across the board. And there's nothing wrong with this. You know, this piano already has a good bit of brightness to it. That's all fine and dandy, but I was, I was experimenting with the idea of like, well, what if I used a different kind of sound to really help bring that part out? It like brings it to the forefront, adds a little bit of brightness to it. It's washed out with a little bit of reverb, which is like, which is good. Um, Sometimes, not all the time, that's not like a rule of thumb. But for the big moments, it helps fill that space, but also bring the part to the forefront. It just adds enough of like a little bit of brightness and like bell toniness to the sound so that it brings the part to the forefront. So that's like another example of a combination between like how your setup works and how your playing works to be able to, that, that piano sound is only on so it actually ends. So the transition between the two sounds is between my B and C, like an octave above middle C. So everything here is all like a normal grand piano sound. But once I get to this C here, it, trans it uh, switches to my CP8 sound. So you get this like brightness from the top end stuff. If I want to hop up and play a part that comes out, I can do it up there and it like has this, that nice quality to it. But if I want to play down here, I don't have to be stuck with that sound. So it's just on this section of the keyboard. Makes sense? You can do the same kind of thing with like layering sounds too. Like if you wanted to, maybe I wanted that piano sound to be, a, the, the normal piano sound to be across the whole board, but just add the CP80 to the top end. You could do stuff like that too, of course. I mean, the sky's the limit with that kind of stuff. Like if you want to get creative with it. Um, and it goes back to the same thing, kind of coming back around to where we started with the pad sound. I don't want the pad sound to voice up there in that high end stuff because it just starts to get a little shrill and a little too thin for me. So like to contrast that, let me show you the, like why I set this this way. If I extend out those layers so that they're voicing with all of those top keys, what'd you say? Right, I mean, it shows you that, Wait, what? We have this one sound that's particularly problematic. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, and so especially if you're like sustaining through, you know, sustaining through stuff, it can just, if I was playing like that three octave thing I was doing earlier, and I'm just going to turn the pad up just for the sake of like kind of showing you what I'm talking about. But like... <laughs> Like all of a sudden there's like all of this like extra added brightness that like just starts to get too shrill and too thin and it's like I don't want that up there. All I want, I only really want my like stacked pad to respond to stuff that's gonna sit in like a decent range. And again, the pad sound can get bright and full using the filter on it without having to play it in like the higher octaves region of the keyboard. Makes sense? So that's why I pull that back um, and like you know, like I said, I'm sure you could do the same kind of thing in Reason. I know you can do it in Ableton. You can just like drag that down to whatever you want your kind of transition point to be for your like layered pad stuff. I find that to be really helpful. Uh, do any of you guys have questions about any of this stuff yet? I, I know I'm, some of this can feel a little jumbled because there's a lot of the combination of the way that what you're playing and how you're manipulating your sounds, they go hand in hand. So it might feel a little bit like I'm bouncing back and forth between like different ideas, but they all play together like in a really important way. And so, do you guys have questions about any of this stuff yet? So I'm tracking. What's up? 
Do I never play? Uh, I mean, yeah, like typically, typically like I'm not, I mean, yeah, this whole, although I will say, you know, getting creative with like, with your setup, if you're only using one keyboard, I will use those keys. Um, you know, if I'm playing a song where like I, you know, I want some like big, you know, like if it's a synthier song and I only really have one keyboard, uh, you know, I'll use most of the keyboard for like whatever, if it's gonna be like a main pad sound. Uh, something kind of like nice and bright, like for if you're playing like a young and free song or like a something more youth oriented, upbeat kind of thing. Like I'll do that kind of stuff down here, but then up at the top is where I'll set like all of my lead sounds so that I can use one keyboard but get the function of having two keyboards with me. So like I'll play like the rest of the lead stuff up here. So like you can have different sections of the keyboard with different functions even. So here's all of my supportive stuff, here's all my lead stuff. That kind of thing I'll do a lot too. Um, obviously if you've got two keyboards, like I usually will just make use out of the second one. For me, like visually it just makes sense for like, I've got this sound on this keyboard and this sound on this one. But when you're limited, you have to get a little creative. So, what's up? Were you gonna say something? Oh, I thought you were. It looked for a second like you were gonna ask something about that. but. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, if it's like a normal piano sound though, like I'm probably not gonna get too twinkly up there unless like you're doing, I don't know. I don't, I don't even have a good example of like what you would use most of this portion of the keyboard for if it was like normal piano sound, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Great question. So that goes back to another voicing thing for me. Um, and I'm glad you asked that because that actually was something I did want to mention as far as like the playing side of thing goes. Um, I think everybody knows this, but like typically our left hand is like primarily just playing the root of whatever chord we're playing. Uh, and there's a reason for that, which is because like you want to be doing what the bit, like what bass is doing basically all the time. Like you don't want to be doing Obviously, nobody thinks this sounds good. Well, <laughs> clearly. But nobody thinks this sounds good. Like, that's not useful for anybody. That's not useful for them back there. Like, it doesn't, it has no function if I'm playing like chords down in like this portion of the keyboard. It's just not going to serve. From like a, a front of house mix standpoint, there's going to be so much mud. You're not really adding to like the clarity of anything. You're not you're not helping anything by playing down there. Now that doesn't mean that the low end of the keyboard is a bad place, just like it doesn't mean that the high end of the keyboard is a bad place either. But it sounds equally as bad for me to kind of be playing like really, like these like shrill chords up here. If, it's, if you're playing dense chords up in the higher region or the lower region of the keyboard, it's either gonna be pretty shrill or pretty muddy. Um, my approach to it is that I usually try to spread out my voicings a good bit, so like, not that you always want to be covering tons and tons of ground with your voicings, but I will, I also, I stretch my hands a good bit, like I'll cover a lot of ground. Um, but in general, I try to keep, you know, you don't want to be playing anything, as far as intervals go, anything closer together than maybe like a perfect fifth in your low hand. And even as you get down to like, if I'm playing in C, that's a C and G, like that open, I'm just playing an octave with the fifth in the middle. But if I drop down and I was gonna play the five chord, which would be a G, and I keep that same voicing, that starts to sound a little muddy already. So like, there's not necessarily one rule of thumb, like, oh, this is a good left hand voicing, or oh, this is a good right hand voicing. There is kind of that transition point though, where around, you know, like around, I guess it would be this A to B transition. I don't know if you can kind of see what I'm talking about on the keyboard. If I'm playing in B, I might add the fifth in, like for some nice, like for, if it's maybe just me and I want like a ton of warmth, like I'll, I'll add that fifth in. But if I'm playing even in A, like one full step lower than that, adding the fifth in and that left hand starts to feel pretty muddy to me. Like all of a sudden that makes that weird transition point where that starts to sound a little bit too, like just too much mud. So finding that transition point for your voicings in your low hand is gonna be important. Like from there on down the keyboard, I won't play the fifth, like in between, like the octaves of my left hand, because um, it just is too much mud. And then same thing like up at the top. There's a certain point where I, you kind of stop playing triads uh, because they're too dense, too high on the keyboard. Um, so like I wouldn't play a C here. 
because to me it just sounds a little too like it's a little too I don't know 90s ballady or something yeah yeah so like what I'll do is if, if you spread out voicings pretty well I'll use a lot sometimes my voicings will look a lot like um, they'll look more dense and like the the lower part of my right hand and then I'll bring out like a voicing with my pinky like higher up on the keyboard so like if I'm playing I'm playing in the key of C again and I'm just playing uh, like four six five one over three this is a voicing I'll use a lot but I'm basically just playing like like an F a standard F major chord in my right hand like F C F a C but instead I'm like using my uh, like octave and fifth thing in my left hand but I'm playing the third of the chord with my like really in octaves with my thumb and pinky and then using the other voicing with my pointer finger so these guys like are staying a little more dense in the warmer part of the keyboard but bringing out whatever voicing I want with my pinky up on the top end does that make sense so down below you get the warmth and connectedness of like the middle range of the keyboard but you can still bring something out if you want to with your pinky. I'll do that a lot as far as voicings go too, versus if I was just playing more like block chords. Like, and there's nothing wrong with that either, but if you want to bring out a certain voicing, that's a good way to do it, is like I'll use, I'll kind of stretch up and use my pinky as like the top end voicing to bring out whatever part I'm trying to bring out. Yeah. No, you're good. We'll break for lunch after, like, after this question. Okay. Uh, something I kind of messed around with you guys is pressing. So a lot of times in the third, especially if you're playing the bass, like, do you use the third to play the really strong stuff? Yeah, you use the third to play the high-tap and forward and try to, try to use, uh, <clears throat> use the third to find the right note. Is, is it being bold or not? Is that third? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, it's kind of a hard one to answer, I think. Um, but you're right, I think... I don't know, in general, I guess in my head, if you want something to feel, uh, I don't know, how do I describe this? Like if I want something to feel massive and powerful, uh, again, this is hard to even use it as a rule of thumb. Like if you really want to like drive home a big one chord, sometimes it's nice to not even put like the third in the voicing. So like if it's like the biggest part of a song, uh, let me think of a good song. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, even What a Beautiful Name is a good example. So, like, when you kind of get to those last couple choruses and you, like, arrive, like, out of this bridge on a big one chord, you know, I probably wouldn't want to land on, like, a big... It almost, like, in those moments, I want it to feel powerful, not necessarily too happy. Uh, so, like, if I land on... Uh, uh, what a beautiful name it is. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. But like, if you kind of open up and it's what a beautiful name it is. Like, you can. It doesn't mean that you have to stay away from the third. But if you want certain moments to feel more powerful, sometimes just like the one and fives of like your one chord are gonna like really drive home. It's basically a power chord, is what it is. So like that feels like super in your face it's not necessarily like too happy as far as like a voicing goes doesn't mean you want to stay away from the third like it's not a bad thing to play like a nice big it almost just sounds a little too triumphant in a sense uh like almost a little too like just happier than you want it to be yeah I like it borders on cheesy a little bit um what'd you say like yeah yeah don't stop bleeding. <laughs> yeah like it just doesn't necessarily have the quality sometimes you want things to be like have guts to them without being happy. So sometimes like if, and again, very take this very loosely like as a rule of thumb kind of thing. Thirds are not a bad thing in a chord. Like don't, don't like, if you're always playing like, like that's super boring. Like there's no, you can't tell what kind of chord you're playing because the third is what determines major versus minor, that kind of stuff. So don't stay away from it, just use it in moments. Like if it was the beginning of a song though, I mean, like, that moment at the beginning of that song where you first bring piano in, I mean, it starts with, like, just latched, like, pad stuff or whatever, like, at the very beginning. But it feels so good in that moment when, like, the piano finally comes in. What a beautiful name it is. And it, like, you can play the third there, 
and it feels nice and warm, but like in massive moments, maybe to like drop that voicing a little bit and just stick to like your powerful stuff can kind of help you out a little bit. So. Yeah, I mean, maybe as a, like a general rule of thumb, yeah, like I'll try to. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, you know, like when I play. I do, I will, I, I would say I do use the third in the middle of my voicings, like, I guess maybe more of the time. Um, it doesn't mean that it's bad to put like the third of the chord anywhere else, like you know, that's, like that's what I'm doing there. But a lot of times if I am trying to play in that like lower to mid region of the keyboard, I do kind of, there's something nice about putting the third somewhere in the middle of the voicing. I will say this is random. This is a voicing I play a lot though, which is like root fifth octave up third in my left hand. Um, it's a way to be able to actually like define, like put definition to what chord you're playing with one hand so that your right hand has the freedom to bring a part out. Um, so I know it also depends on like how long your fingers are and how big your hand is. Sometimes it's hard. What'd you say? Yeah, yeah. But I will say, like, it's something to teach yourself to stretch your hand. That is something I do a lot, is I'll stretch my left hand really far. Yeah. <laughs> it is something, like, if you can, some of it is comfortability, though. Like, you can do it, but it, you have to teach yourself to be comfortable with it. Um, but it actually is a really useful tool, like, if you are able to stretch your hand like that, because you get the chord definition out of one hand. Um, and it's actually the hand that if you can do it, it leaves your right hand like the ability to bring parts out. So I can play a C chord with just my left hand and then I can play one, five, six, four all day with just this one hand. As opposed to like you can play just like the octave fifth thing in your left hand, but you're not getting any of the third, like the chord definition out of it. So you can play all of that with just one hand and then have the freedom to move around like So like I can move around with my right hand and like you can still track with the chord progression just with the one hand. That's another like pretty convenient thing. So again, don't shy away from like thirds of chords. It's not like, they're not bad, it's not a bad thing. Um, but yeah, sometimes just knowing when that voicing makes things have a different kind of emotion to it is gonna be important. So yeah, cool.